type of congressional caucuses. These are different from the caucuses during um, the nomination contests. These are congressional caucuses. These are informal groups that exist within Congress. Think of them as like clubs. They're informal. They're not like committees where they have a very important job to do. Um, congressional caucuses are informal organizations. Just some members of Congress feel like they want to meet together. They want to they want to communicate together, so they form these little clubs in Congress. So think of them like clubs. They're informal groups. Composed of members of Congress with similar characteristics. That could be their race. That could be their ideology. That could be the region that they live in. So these are like clubs that exist within Congress, made of members that share something in common. Whether that be their race, their ideology, things that they really care about. That's a congressional caucus. All right, an example would be what, what you can see on the board. That picture on the board is one of the caucuses that exists in, in Congress. Anybody know what that caucus is called? This is the Congressional Black Caucus. They're made up of members of Congress that are what? That are African American. If you're a white member of Congress, you try to get in here, they'll probably use So an example would be of the Black Caucus. There's also a women's caucus made up of members of Congress who are women. There's the Sun Belt Caucus. There's a lot of different caucuses that exist within Congress. Little clubs that exist within um, Congress, <coughs> Senate, and the House of Representatives. Is there a white caucus? Uh, that sounds. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. There might have been. There might be. Uh, to give you an idea of which caucuses exist, these are the different caucuses in. There's a lot of them, some of them have been disbanded already. Alright. Congressional caucuses are different from our interest groups. The difference between the NAACP and the Congressional Black Caucus, what's the difference? If you're the NAACP, in order to get something done, in order to get a policy pushed through, you need to do a lot of strategies like lobbying, litigation, and stuff like that. What's the advantage the Black Caucus have over the NAACP in terms of representing African American um, interests? They're already in Congress, so they can represent directly. They have the votes that they need to pass laws as well. So the difference between an interest group and a uh, congressional caucus is caucuses can represent their interests directly. They're part of government already. They're members of Congress. They can represent those interests directly. They don't need lobbyists because they're the ones that are making the call. They are calling the shots. They're the ones that vote on bills. Because sometimes these guys are ineffective, or they don't, they don't do as much. Because again, they have pressure from their constituents and stuff. They push for desired legislation. They get votes to pass desired legislation that would benefit whatever interests that they represent, whether that be the women's interests or African American interests. They're there in Congress. They can push. They can use the influence that they have and push for desired legislation to pass through and maybe kill legislation that don't benefit their particular interest group. All right, now let's talk about congressional staffers, people that work in Congress. Um, their main job is to help out um, individual congressmen, senators, and House of Representative members. There are about 12,000 staffers that work with congressmen 
or and congresswomen. A lot of them work in DC. But some of these staffers are not just in DC. Some of these staffers are where? In the home district or the home state of a senator, in the home offices of these, uh, in the constituency of, of these representatives. So some work in DC, some work with the constituency. In their home state or their home district, their hope, they work with the representative's constituency. So right now, if you try to call Vicente Gonzalez your district representative for District 15, you're gonna get your, their answer will probably, uh, your call will be probably answered by one of these staffers, paid for by your taxpayer money. All right, there are staff agencies that exist within Congress. Staff agencies work for everybody. They're not exclusive to just one individual representative or to one senator. They work for everybody in Congress. So the one that you need to remember is the Congressional Research Service. Their job is they're basically the Google of Congress. Congressional Research Service provides members of Congress with information. So let's say a committee is talking about a bill, or maybe the House or the Senate are debating a bill, and congressmen want information. The best way, to, the best people to ask uh, is the Congressional Research Service. They work at the Library of Congress, where they have access to information that normal people don't have. They know the data. They can give the data and the information to the congressman that needs it in order to make good decisions when it comes to passing or failing bills. All right, there's also the Congressional Budget Office. Their job is they analyze the President's budget for Congress. So you should know um, our country right now is in danger of having a shutdown. It's because Congress and the President are in disagreement about the budget. The President of the United States turns in a budget to Congress, but Congress has to approve the President's budget. How much money are we going to give to each agency and department of the federal government? And if they can't agree, the government shuts down. A lot of those agencies and departments are going to be unfunded for a while. These are the guys that take a look at the president's budget first, and then they make notes and cliff notes for the members of Congress so that they can see what the president wants, how much money each agency that the president wants to give. Um, but again, they have to come into agreement, Congress and the president, otherwise the government gets shut down, a lot of people get affected by it. But these are the people that basically dubs it down for our congressmen, gives them the notes that they need to make a good decision whether or not to approve the president's budget or to reject it. All right, this is our main topic today. I don't want you to write anything down yet. We're going to write everything down at the end. Main topic today is how a bill becomes a law in the United States Congress. Most of your FRQ will be about this. I think everybody's here already. Tomorrow, tonight you don't have homework. Um, but what's going to happen tomorrow, probably at the end of class, is we're going to have an oral quiz. It's going to replace your quiz grade. It's going to be worth two quiz grades. It's going to be about five to seven questions long. It's going to be about what we talked about today. Whatever notes that you write down, you can use on that quiz, but you probably should not use it because we're only going to have like five minutes. If you're looking up answers, you're not going to be able to, you're not going to be able to catch up because there's a limited amount of time. Make sure that you look over your notes beforehand so you know where things are. So if you're looking up something, if you have to look up something, you know where it is at already. Or maybe you, you would remember it in your head. But last five minutes of class, that's what we're going to be doing. So tonight, study the notes that we've taken for lesson three, and that's what's going to be on your quiz. Yes, ma'am? Wait, so like if you speak, you get 100. If you don't speak, like you get No, I'm going to be telling you the questions, and you write down the answers, kind of like what we did before. Oh, so, so I just it is your basically your homework grade for the day oh. instead of us having an actual homework. Yes. Uh, will you post the video about the lesson today? I will. Yes. All right. So let's talk about how a bill becomes a law. Uh, first of all, who can write a bill? Who can write legislation in the United States? Uh -huh. So anyone can write legislation. I can write legislation if I want to. 
you don't have to be a member of Congress to write legislation. A lot of this, uh, a lot of the laws that have been passed in, in Congress are not written by members of Congress. A lot of them are written by lobbyists from interest groups. A lot of them are written by White House experts or White House advisors by the President of the United States. But in order to submit a piece of legislation to Congress, who's going to have to submit or propose that legislation? It has to be someone from where? Someone from the House or someone from the what? Someone from the Senate. You have to be a member of Congress to propose the legislation. Anybody could have written that legislation, but you need to be a member of Congress to actually formally propose that. So anybody can write bills, but only members of Congress can propose that bill officially in front of Congress. Where can bills come from? Can they come from both houses or just one house? Both. They can come from both houses. Uh, a member of the House can, can propose a bill. A senator can propose a bill also if he wants to, except for one exception. What kind of bills can only come from a House of Representatives member? Tax. We talked about this before. Bills that have to do with what? Tax. Taxing, raising taxes or lowering taxes comes from them. They have the power of the purse. So any tax bills have to originate in the House of Representatives. A senator cannot propose new taxes, for example. Only House of Representative members can. Once a bill is proposed by a member of Congress, who do we give that bill to? The Senate, who takes that bill? Oh, speaker. Remember yesterday, who do we give that bill to? Committee. Uh, to a committee. We give that bill to a standing committee, whoever is in charge of that particular policy area. If it's about farming, who do we give that, bi that bill to? To the Agricultural Committee. But here's the thing, in the House of Representatives, the guy who's in charge of putting bills and giving them to committees is the Speaker of the House. I told you this is the most powerful man in Congress, and there's a reason why. That ability to be able to assign bills to specific committees can make it more likely or less likely for a bill to pass. So let's say I was the Speaker of the House, and I see this bill. My job is to give it to a committee. Let's say I like the bill. How can I make it more likely for this bill to pass? You can give it to a committee that's more likely to do what? More likely to pass it. Or I can give it to multiple committees because it only takes how many committees to pass it for it to be talked about on the House floor? One. So what I can do with it is I can give it to a committee that I know is going to pass it or I can assign it to multiple committees to increase its chances of getting passed because I know it only takes one committee for that whole thing to be released to the House floor for debate. So the Speaker of the House has a lot of power in making it more likely or less likely for a bill to pass. So Speaker of the House assigns a bill to a committee, and what does the committee do with that bill? They analyze it. How do they analyze it? How do they talk about it? What do we call those? They call for a what? A hearing. They call for a committee hearing where they analyze it. Who do they bring in? Lobbyists. lobbyists, experts, so that they can testify about the merits or the disadvantage of the bill. What can a committee do with a bill while it's in committee? They can attach the report They can change it. They can amend the bill. They can rewrite it. They can add stuff to it. They can subtract stuff to it. But at the end, two things can happen. Number one, they can pass the bill. It's called a favorable recommendation. If the majority of the committee likes the bill, they can release it to the House floor so that the whole House of Representatives can take a look at the bill and vote yes or no. So if they like the bill, they release it by giving it a good recommendation so that the House floor can see it all, the, the other members of the House of Representatives can take a look at the bill and vote yes or no on the bill. What else can they do with it? They can change it or they can do what? Deny it. They can deny it, they can kill it right away. Most bills die there. Remember that. That's always a favorite question that they ask in AP exams. Where do most bills die? They die early on, and they usually die in committee. The committee, it doesn't want the bill to be released, so it dies in committee. In the House of Representatives, only in the House of Representatives, however, there's a way for a stubborn committee to be forced to release a bill to the House floor. So let's say the 435, most of the 435 members of the House want to vote on a bill because they want it to pass, maybe. But a committee that that bill is put on, they don't want to release the bill to the House floor. They're, they're, they're refusing to give it a favorable recommendation. So here's what they can do. They can call for something called a discharge petition. What, is, what does it mean to discharge? To let go. To, let go. to what? Release. To release. Discharge means to release. So a discharge petition requires 
a majority of the House of Representative members to force the committee to release the bill, even if they don't want to release the bill? What's a majority of 435? What's more than half of 435? So more than half, right? So <laughs> cut it in half and then add one. Yeah, uh, I don't know the number, but that's 218. 218 members of the House of Representatives can call for a discharge petition. At that point, the committee has no choice. Even if they don't want to, they have to release the bill to the House of Representatives. This is not usually done because if you call for a discharge petition, you're questioning whose expertise. You're, you're questioning the committee's expertise. You're telling them they're not good at their job. So to, risk of, to not risk offending the members of the committee, they don't usually do a discharge petition but they can. This is sometimes done, and a lot of the committee members get offended by it. All right. Once a bill is released from the committee, it doesn't go to the House floor right away. It goes to what we call the House Rules Committee. We talked about this before, but between the both houses, where, is, where are rules more important? House. The House of Representatives. Because before a bill reaches the House floor, the committee has to give it to something to another committee called the House Rules Committee. What the House Rules Committee does is they assign rules for debate so that when the bill goes to the House of Representatives, there are certain rules and restrictions um, put on the bill when it's being debated upon by the entire House of Representatives. So what kind of rules can they put on? Number one, they can, they're the ones that schedule the bill for debate. So they're the ones that, that, that um, assign the bill on the calendar. So they're the ones that can put priorities on bills when they're getting debated on the House floor. Number two, they can assign how long the bill will be debated on the House floor. So they can give it four hours, they can give it six hours, they can give it two days, but the House Rules Committee decides how long will the bill be debated <coughs> upon. And number three, they can decide what kind of amendments can be put on a bill. How strict or how loose um, can, can the bill be amended? Now, that doesn't seem like a lot, but the House Rules Committee can determine how likely a bill can pass also. So let's say the House Rules Committee sees a bill. It has no choice. It has to release it to the House of Representatives, but they can make it less likely for that bill to pass. How? Giving it less time. Giving it less time. So let's say they give it one hour so that the House of Representative members don't have a lot of time to look over the bill and talk about the bill. So it's going to be less likely for them to vote yes on the bill. So they give it less time. What else can they do? Less amendments. They can say, you can't put a lot of amendments. They can say, you have to vote on this bill the way it is. You can't add anything to it. You cannot subtract anything to it. There's not a lot of leeway. So members of the House of Representatives will be less likely to vote on that bill because they can't change it they can't change it to suit themselves. So they can be very, very strict with it. What else can they do? So they can put restriction on amendments. Sorry? They can put it as very, very low priority. They can put it below the calendar. They can, they can not make it priority. So they can schedule it very, very late. Does that make sense for everybody? All committees in the House of Representatives are controlled by which party? The majority. The majority party. So today, who controls the House Rules Committee? Republicans. Republicans. So what does that mean? Liberal policy and conservative policy, which one is going to be more likely to pass? Conservative. Conservative policy. Because the House Rules Committee will be very strict on liberal policies to make them less likely to pass, but they're going to be very loose on conservative policies to make them more likely to pass. Does that make sense for everybody? Yes. Right. So once the House Rules Committee puts restrictions and rules for debate, it gets released to the House floor. And the entire House of Representatives gets to take a look at the bill. If I have a question, if I was a member of Congress and I have a question about the bill, who should I probably ask? The committee, the committee members, right? Because they know exactly what's on the bill. They're the ones that released it to the House floor, so they know what's going on. What can happen to the bill on the House floor? So before the vote, what can happen to the, uh, on the bill on the House floor? Can they still change the bill on the House floor? Yes. yes, depending on who? The House rule. House depending rules. on what the House Rules Committee says. So you can still change the bill, maybe. But let's say 
I want this bill to pass, but I know there's not enough votes for this bill to pass. So I want to get more votes from you guys. What can I do for you to support my, my bill? What do we call those? Pork battles. We call them riders. Riders are attachments that you attach to a bill to make it more likely to pass. So let's say I need Hiram's vote. So I'll tell Hiram, um, on this bill, I'm going to give you $5 million for your home district so that you can go ahead and pass this bill. So if you say yes, you're also saying yes to what? You're also saying yes to $5 million for your home district. Why would Hiram want to do that? Because next election, he can do what? I got this for you. You can claim what? You can claim credit for that particular bill. So they can attach riders or they can uh, attach um, things that would make it more likely for the bill to pass, like pork barrel spending. Other things that can happen during the debate on the House floor. Um, let's say I want Hiram's vote. What I can do is, Hiram, if you say yes for my bill today, what will I do for you? Support yes, to yours. Next time you have a bill that you sponsor, what am I going to do? Yes. I'm going to vote yes on that bill. So they're exchanging political favor. So I'll vote on your bill if you vote for my bill. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. That is called log rolling. Log rolling. Okay. Alright. But when we come down to a vote after the time limit is done, how much does it take to pass a bill in the House of Representatives? A simple majority, which is always what? Most votes. 218. Or however, or more than half of however many members attended that day or present that day. So with a 218 vote, a bill can pass the House floor. Is the work done? Now where does it need to go? It needs to go to the Senate. Now, don't get me wrong, you can propose bills in the Senate also, but once the Senate passes it, where does it need to go? It needs to go to the House. So let's take this bill to the Senate. In the Senate, they don't have much, a lot of politics in the Senate. They don't, they don't have a Speaker of the House that assigns bills to committees. They just have a clerk, and he's kind of like a bipartisan guy. He just assigns bills to the committee that makes the most sense. So if it's a technology bill, he assigns it to the Science Committee. So they don't have a Speaker of the House that plays politics. They have some guy that works there that assigns it to the committee that makes the most sense. So the bill will be assigned to a committee. The Senate clerk assigns it to a committee. What does the committee do with it? They, a they do a hearing. They bring in what? Experts. Like experts, like lobbyists, and they can do what to the bill? Change. They can change it. Um, they can also release the bill or they can fail the bill. But unlike in, in the House of Representatives, if a, Sen if a Senate committee refuses to release a bill, there is no discharge petition. What will happen to the bill? Dies. It will die. There is no choice. If a committee in the Senate refuses to release the bill, it will die. There is no discharge petition in the House of Representatives. There's no alternative way. But let's say the Senate releases the bill. In the House of Representatives, where would it go automatically? To the House Rules House to the House Rules Committee. In the Senate, there's not a lot of rules. So where does it go automatically? Senate floor. It goes to the Senate floor. It goes directly to the Senate floor. In the Senate, there is no rules committee. That only exists in the House of Representatives. Because in the Senate, you know that there's no time limit. What can a senator do in the Senate floor? Filibuster. He can filibuster. He can talk and talk to delay the what? To delay the vote. So in the Senate, one senator can conduct a filibuster because there's no time limit, unlike in the House of Representatives. He can, he can just talk and talk so that he can delay a bill's passage. So he can delay the vote for the bill and ultimately try to kill the bill by delaying its passage. In the Senate floor, just like in the House, in the house floor, um, senators can make deals with each other. What do we call that again? Right. Log roll. They can also atta attach things to the bill to make it easier to pass. What do we call those? Right. Riders. Examples are what? Pork barrels. They can attach pork barrels to a bill to make it easier to pass. How much does it take to pass a bill in the Senate? Majority. A majority, which is how many senators? More than, More than half. So that would be 51 senators to pass a bill. But in reality, because of the what? Filibuster. Because of the filibuster, how many do you actually need to pass something in the Senate? You need 60 to call for a what? What do we call that? That's what a C. How do you end a filibuster? Cloture. A cloture. You need to call for a cloture. It takes 60 senators to pass a bill. So in reality, in the Senate, if there's one senator that does a filibuster, to get over that filibuster, you're going to need 60 senators to be able to pass a bill. Is everybody with me so far? So let's say House passes a bill. The Senate also passes the bill. 
What happens next? Vote for the president? Mm -hmm. Darn it. Uh, Screw the president. <laughs> Remember yesterday, what happens to a bill? Sorry? Reviewed for what? It was Constitution. Conference Committee. There you go. Yesterday we talked about a conference <laughs> committee. What's the conference committee's job? We know that this House version of a bill and this Senate version of a bill are going to be what? They're going to be different. Whose responsibility is to reconcile those differences? The conference committee. So a conference committee is called from the members of both houses and their job is to take the Senate version and the House version and kind of put them together and come up with a version that both houses will like. After you're done with that, they have to give it back to the House and they have to give it back to the Senate for one final approval. But most of the time, once a bill reaches the conference committee, it's already going to pass. Um, so we give it back to them for one final approval, but after both houses approve of it, who does it go to next? Who does it go to next? After the conference committee is done working out the differences, after the both houses, both houses finally approves it again. It goes to whose desk? It goes to the president's desk, <laughs> where, <laughs> where after all that hard work, what can the president do with it? Veto. Veto. <laughs> so what you should know is, at every single point in this process, a bill can die. Committees can make it less likely for a bill to pass. Committees can deny the release of a bill. In the House floor, in the Senate floor, bills can die there also. The Speaker of the House can make it less likely for a bill to die. This is a very hard thing to do. A lot of bills don't even make it past committee. And when it reaches the president's desk, all the president can, uh, can, can, can do to stop a bill from passing is he can veto the bill. Or he can sign it and turn it into a law. There is a way to do what to a president's veto. Override it. Override it. There's a way to override a president's veto. Anybody know what's the way? I'm sorry? I think, you're, I think that, that you're correct. You need two thirds of both houses. If two, if you, it's not seven, right? Two thirds, not seven, two thirds, two thirds. If you get two thirds of both houses to say yes on a particular bill, then a veto can be overridden. It doesn't matter how many times the president say no, they can override a veto. But how likely is it to get two thirds of Congress to agree on something? It's very unlikely. So sometimes. A president's veto, most of the time a president's veto is the death nail for a bill. It's dead there. It's going to be very unlikely for you to get two-thirds of both houses. So not a lot of vetoes get overwritten. About 5% of all presidential vetoes get overwritten. 95%, they just die. All right. Anybody have any questions so far? How about the Congress just says screw the president? I think they're just done with him once they veto it. Well, most laws fail. All right, let's go over this together. Who can propose bills? Anyone can propose. I'm sorry, anyone can write a bill. Your mother, my mother, I would love to. No. It's often written by lobbyists, people that work for the president, the White House. Sometimes corporations. But only members of Congress can actually propose them. Only members of Congress can propose them. All right, question. Tax bills can only originate from which house? House of Representatives. The house of Representatives. <laughs> only from the House of Representatives, not the Senate. first before the Senate, like we did with the lecture. 
What is the Speaker of the House? What's his responsibility in the House of Representatives? He assigns the bills to what? To a committee. Assigns bills to committees. And with that ability, he has the power to make it more likely or less likely for a bill to pass. So it influences the likelihood of a bill passing. So yes. he can give the bills to any committee, like even if it doesn't make sense for him to give it to that? Uh, people are probably going to complain if he does that. Okay. <laughs> but he can give it to someone with even like a little bit of connection. <laughs> What can he do with preferred bills that he likes? He can make it priority. He can give it to what? Multiple. Multiple. Give it to multiple favorable committees, committees that are more likely going to pass the bill. What does he do with unwanted bills that he doesn't like? He still needs to give it to a committee, but how many committees would he give it to? Just one. Give it to a few committees. And maybe you want you might want to give it to very unsympathetic committees, committees that are not going to matter, or that are not or are likely to pass it. <sighs> All right. Sorry. Again, guys, I'll, I'll post this on your on your Google Classroom. Just make a little note if you didn't complete an, uh, a particular portion of the assignment. So it gets assigned to a standing committee. Standing committee. Investigates the bill. They conduct hearings to judge the merits of the bill. They hear testimonies from experts, lobbyists. Bills can be amended in committee. Scenario number one, the majority of the committee likes the bill and gives it a favorable recommendation. The bill is released. But that scenario is the least likely outcome for the bill the more likely outcome is they kill the bill outright in the committee and the bill dies right away. Scenario two, the bill fails. The bill is killed off. This is where most bills die. 